The Denver Broncos beefing up their offense in the latest five-round mock draft simulation. We'll take a look and see if this boosts the Broncos' chances in 2024 on today's brand new episode, Locked on Broncos. You are Locked on Broncos, your daily Denver Broncos podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Broncos country? Welcome into a brand new episode of Locked On Broncos, your daily Denver Broncos podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you so much to everybody in Broncos country, all the everydayers out there who make us your first listen of the day every single day. Just a reminder, you can get this podcast for free on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast. So do us a favor. If you haven't done so already, make sure you hit that subscribe or that follow button down below so you never miss out on a day's worth of Broncos news, content, coverage, analysis, and more every single day, all year long, because for the true fan, there's never an offseason. I'm Cody York, Broncos reporter from Mile High Sports, joined alongside, as always, by Sarah Bettinger, site expert, put on the orange.com. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. And right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's 200 bucks. If your bet wins, visit fanduel.com slash locked on to get started. Sarah, you know what it is now. NFL free agency has really come and gone. The Broncos have made a, a wide bulk of their moves here. So now our focus here on the podcast shifts towards the NFL draft. And you know what Mondays are, Broncos country. It is mock draft Monday where sometimes we'll conduct a manual mock draft. Sometimes we'll conduct a simulated mock draft. And first, let me give you this, this little disclaimer here for today's episode show. Mock drafts meant to be a fun exercise and engagement of discourse and discussion in the comments section and on social media, not to be taken seriously. So if you have a problem with that, please consult the fun police at your own disclosure. Sarah, let's open it up, my friend. I ran a simulation on Pro Football Network's mock draft simulator. Obviously, Denver has eight picks in this year's draft. I ran a five-round mock draft for them just because there was a lot of action going on here. And I think the fifth round, like ideally Denver through there, they're going to have a lot of value. Of course, they have two picks in the sixth round but this is a five-round mock draft, and they went all offense for the most part in this mock draft simulator. But first, 12th overall, who did the Broncos take? 12th overall pick, Bo Nix, Cody, from Oregon, the quarterback. I think a lot of Broncos fans at this point are kind of, I don't know if coming to grips with this idea is the best way of putting it. I think a lot of people do really like Bo Nix and, and getting to like him a bit more as we kind of get to hear from him. I saw a great segment that he did with Colin Cowherd on, on his show the other day and just kind of getting to talk and getting to hear a little bit more about him. He actually sounds a lot like Tim Tebow. If you if you close your eyes while, while listening to him, he does sound a little bit like Tim. But I think that he's a fascinating guy, isn't he? I mean, he's married. He's He's got a family. Like, he moved from coast to coast. There's There's aspects of his story that, like, when Colin Cowherd brings some of these things up, you hear them and you're kind of like, okay, yes, like you're buying into the person. You're buying into the person who's going to be leading the franchise. And of course, everything that we hear about Bo Nix's game, there's we've talked about this for the last couple of months. A lot of folks in the media world seem to think that his game translates really well to a Sean Payton offense. And it, it's kind of what he describes when he says, when we talk about you need to be a quick processor, you need to be accurate, you need to be on time, you need to stay within structure as much as possible. I kind of found it interesting that he did, he went a little in depth with Cowherd about, you know, why it's not really good if you're ad libbing all the time out there on the field. Like you don't want to always have to get to that point. And he, he made a great point. He's like, you know, the defenses are paid too, like they're paid to make you have to do that. But ultimately, that's not where you want to get to. So I like Bo Nix a lot, Cody. I think at 12th overall, there would be a lot of, I don't think you're ever going to get any unanimous, you know, unanimously yeah. liked pick in Broncos country. But I think at 12th overall, I think a lot of people would buy in. I mean, his overall body of work at Oregon, we talk about it, you know, 4,500 yards, 43 passing touchdowns compared to three interceptions, a 77.4 completion percentage. And the one thing you see on Twitter, and look, it's, it becomes an echo of group think here. Well, he only throws screens. Like, yeah, he threw a lot of screens at Oregon, but I think people fail to realize if you actually go back and watch Oregon games, he's a consistent three-level thrower, right? Short to intermediate. He does take the check down. He hits the, the second level stuff. He can hit the deep ball stuff. I, I But everyone just focuses on, okay, well, he just throws a lot of screens. The same criticism was had about Justin Herbert. That's part of Oregon's offensive system. Now, I thought Chrissy Freud of A to Z Sports did a great interview with Oregon offensive coordinator Will Stein here, and she even brought up that. Like Bo Nix, if you look at it, averaged 9.6 yards per attempt, which was, you know, it ranks top 10 nationally in terms of passing yards per attempt there. 
she brought up these narratives and this is what will stein said he said i think it's an absolute joke narrative to be honest we are a west coast system passing game which is a catch and run game we throw slants we throw hitches we throw a true quick game Bo is a master of taking what the defense gives us and we're going to take our plenty of shots per game and on top of that when you start dicing up guys in the short to intermediate stuff then you start to get them to play a little bit more aggressive then that's where you take your deep shots that's where play action comes in and then he says, I think the narrative surrounding Bo Nix is hysterical. I think it's a product of they hate us because they ain't us type of thing. And I'll let them say that for the rest of the time. But he describes Nix. You know, you look at the things that Sean Payton's looking for, right? A quick processor, a guy who can get the ball out of his hands quickly. He says this. He throws the ball on time. They can have all types of narratives that they want. But to me, it's a sign of having a quarterback who knows exactly what he wants to go and where he wants to go with the football. To me, that's important, right? And that's what Sean Payton has been looking for. There wasn't a lot of that with Russell Wilson in Denver's offense, the way that it was designed last season, but that's something that, you know, he had a Drew Brees and we're not comparing him to Drew Brees in any way, but that's what made that Saints offense hum. Quick processing and being able to get the ball out quickly. I think that's where Bo Nix would be a really good fit here for the Broncos. And look, Sarah, there was another addition to the offense here that I felt like could be a high potential type of pick. And round number 376 overall, the Pro Football Network mock draft simulator has the Broncos taking South Carolina wide receiver Xavier Leggett. And to me, this is very, very interesting. I think there's a wide variety of different consensus. I want to go back to what you mentioned about Justin Jefferson a few years ago. Mock draft simulators had him going in the fourth round. They have him going in the third round here. He's a guy that I feel like could be a number two or a number one wide receiver eventually in the NFL. He's got a lot of really intriguing skills, doesn't he? I mean, he's listed as 6'3", but he came in at the combine at 6'1". So you and I were talking about before the show, like, is that ideal wide receiver one size? Does that really matter when you're talking about a third rounder? I love I love the frame of this guy and the way that he goes up and attacks the ball. He takes the ball in contested catch situations, and he's aggressive after the catch. He's one of those guys, Cody, when you talk about RAS, <clears throat> I mean, listen to these numbers that he posted at the combine. A 4.39 in the 40-yard dash, a 40-inch vertical jump, a 10-6 in the broad jump, and that RAS score overall for him, 9.88. So we're talking about a guy right here who is elite uh, of elite athletes at the wide receiver position. The Broncos need more guys like this, right? They, they, they lack the juice, or as we talked about back in the 2017 draft. They need guys with some juice out there. Marvin Mims, he's going to bring plenty of speed to the table. And I think you have to consider wide receiver with Cortland Sutton's situation beyond this year or maybe even including this year up in the air. Tim Patrick re-signing on essentially just a prove-it deal with the team. The Broncos do need receivers, and they need help, at the, especially if you draft a quarterback. One of my favorite things to do or what you see teams do, you double up and, and add those playmakers or get that offensive line set up. I would love to see the Broncos do this. They have a top 10 offensive line by many metrics last year. Get the playmakers for the young QB. When you look at his production in 2023 at South Carolina, 12 games played, 71 catches for 1,255 yards and seven touchdowns. Also averaged 17.7 yards per catch. Is a guy that I saw, you know, getting vertical, getting behind defensive backs. A guy who is very efficient at catching a slant route and then housing it. Like he's got all of those tools that you need. Well, I think when you look at today's need for wide receivers, look, there's other guys in the discussion that you can talk about that are in this year's class that obviously have very, very strong prototypes about them that are going to go in round one. Who's to say, though, this could be another one of those guys that explodes onto the scene here and could add the value, I think, that the Broncos need to the receiver position because of the points that you mentioned. Cortland and Tim may, may not be back after 2024. Who do you have after that? Marvin Mims can't just be the only guy there, so you have to build the arsenal here in the 2024 NFL draft. So Broncos country, we want to ask you, what do you think about the Broncos first two picks in this mock draft simulation? Bo Nix at 12. And then when you look at 76 overall in the round three, you had Xavier Leggett out of South Carolina at the wide receiver position. Denver going bang, bang, one, two punch quarterback wide receiver. Let us know if you're listening or watching to lockdown Broncos, wherever you get your podcast. We're going to continue going down the line here for the Broncos in this latest mock draft simulation here on this Monday episode of Locked On Broncos, Denver adding a familiar face to one of their coaches that are on staff. We'll dive deeper into that here on today's brand new episode, Locked On Broncos. 
Today's Locked On Broncos podcast is brought to you by our friends over there at FanDuel Sportsbook. Say goodbye to busted brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the tournament. Now, even if your bracket got busted on day one, day two, or even day three of the big event here in the month of March, you still have an opportunity to win with FanDuel. Whether you're betting on a big upset or a one seed, it's time to go dancing on America's number one sportsbook. And right now, new customers, they get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. You just sign up at FanDuel. You go to the link, fanduel.com slash locked on. You sign up, you place a $5 bet. That $5 bet wins, bang, you get $200 in bonus bets that you can use on point spreads, money lines, and you can even pick who's going to win it all as the bracket starts to dwindle down to the sweet 16. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets. After going with the offensive side of the ball in their top two picks, the Denver Broncos turned to the defensive side of the ball in this 2024 mock draft simulation that Cody and I are going to be discussing today. Where did they go defensively? Uh, a little help in the trenches along the way. We're going to break down the next selection in this mock draft simulation on today's episode, Locked on Broncos, but want to say thank you to every single one of you that makes Locked on Broncos your first listen of the day. Every single day, wherever and however you listen to podcasts right here on the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. And subscribe on YouTube if you haven't already because it's NFL draft season. There's going to be things happening all over the place from now until the NFL draft, and then especially during and after the NFL draft. So you want to be tuned in, subscribed, and follow wherever and however you choose to listen to the show. Cody, let's talk about Mason Smith, the third round, or excuse me, the fourth round selection for the Broncos in this mock draft simulation. The Broncos have a first round pick, third round pick, and then on day three, they're kind of loaded up. They've got six selections. So Mason Smith, the defensive lineman out of LSU, just so happens that the simulator maybe knows a little something about the connection that you and I talked about between Mason and some of these other LSU players because Jamar Kane, the Broncos defensive line coach, he was on staff there at LSU in 2022. So he's very familiar with the personnel. You and I have talked a little bit about this guy. I like this pick a lot, especially coming from a simulation, kind of knowing exactly what direction to take the Broncos here on day three. And you factor in too, like you mentioned, like his first game of his sophomore year, he had a season ending injury, didn't get a play. But last year at LSU, I think it's super important. He played in 12 games overall. And in those 12 games, he had 28 tackles at his position on the defensive line, four and a half of those tackles being for a loss behind the line of scrimmage, something Denver needs a little bit more production out of on their trench wide. You know, we talk about edge rushers, Nick Benito, Jonathan Cooper did a great job in TFLs, but if you can get a guy that can penetrate through the A or the B gap and get in the backfield and tackle guys behind the line of scrimmage, that is a big boost to what you can do defensively. And he also had two and a half sacks and two passes batted down. But his first season at LSU back in 2021, in just seven games, Sarah, I was blown away at the fact, and when you go back and you watch those seven games, he was on a little bit of a tear from a production standpoint. 19 tackles in those seven games, five tackles behind the line of scrimmage for a loss, and four sacks there. And as you mentioned last week when we did an episode talking about Denver needing to really build in the trenches after the Malcolm Roach signing an NFL free agency, the, the fact that Jamar Kane, now the defensive line coach here in Denver, has coached this guy to be able to play in multitude of positions on the defensive line, that adds to that positional versatility. Now, I know everyone's going to be like, well, he had the season-ending injury. I still think for him, coming off that major injury that he had, to be able to play in 12 games this past season, that is a big boost. And look, I think right there, you would have your other rotational piece right there on the defensive line, specifically in the middle, you know, right next to DJ Jones and Zach Allen, right? We believe that Malcolm in the middle is going to be there a lot, but he's not going to play every snap. He's, he's a guy that doesn't play a lot of snaps because of his size, but you can rotate him. You can rotate a guy like Mason Smith and maybe even Rashard Lawrence if he does make the roster in training camp. Yeah, I think this gives you the opportunity to get a fourth round pick that's probably going to come in and contribute right away. Like you said, just kind of slotting right into that rotation and giving you some much needed depth. But not only that, I love the upside play we saw in 2021. Remember, we've talked about how revered that draft class was after that first season when George Payton took over as GM of the team and won an award essentially for for that draft class. It was so good that first year. There was a common theme among a lot of those players, and it was the fact that they were former five star prospects coming out of high school. And that was, you know, Patrick Sertan, Caden Stearns, Jonathan Cooper, Baron Browning like those guys were all five star guys. 
So the Broncos were kind of taking some risks on guys who were maybe not exactly living up to their full potential at the college level, but they were guys who have been, their talent has been there from the very beginning. And you trust in the coaching staff to develop and get the most out of these guys. Why not take another five-star former number one recruit in Mason Smith and get him to a guy who has coached him already and get him into a rotation. He, he's he's going to be able to step in at a, any position the Broncos ask. You, you want him to rotate over the nose? He can do it. You want him to play defensive end? He can do it. So I think that there's huge benefits there. And this is where you get guys, you, you draft them in the fourth round, and you kind of get them at a discounted price because he's probably going to end up being a better pro than he was in college. And I just I love that kind of thinking. Let's get the, let's get a guy who maybe the numbers were down because of the knee injury, right, and, and things like that. And you start to look at what's the vision for the player. Well, we need somebody to contribute right away because this guy knows how to play all the positions on the defensive front. He can do that for you. Well, and I want to reference here too. Dalton Miller, Pro Football Network, put this in his scouting report on Mason Smith. Here says this in terms of his size. Like obviously for him, he's six foot five, three hundred six pounds. His RAS score is eight point nine seven. So for a guy who's six foot five, over three hundred pounds, to be at close to that nine range on the RA on the RAS scale, I think is very impressive. But what he says right here stands out. Says here his frame may be the most frightening since Sean Oakman. Those who know know exactly how big and how scary Sean Oakman was in terms of frame size, and his game resembles Stephon Tuitt and David Irving. Says his freakish athleticism paired with improved hands and a little experience could secure him a top ten selection come April. This was obviously done last year. Uh, you know, when they were doing the scouting report and the analysis on him, obviously, I think there was so much contingent upon how many games he played this past season. But for 12 there, that's a nice little ad, you know, area of advantage for him there. But the frame, the athleticism, that can't be ignored, especially when that's something that Denver needs. Not only just this year, but think about it next year. DJ Jones is going to be a free agent as well, Sarah. So Denver's going to have to figure out what their plan is here on the defensive line going forward. I think this would be a great addition to what Denver wants to achieve especially getting into that rotation, getting a guy that is well-known by this coaching staff. So now you know him coming into the NFL, you know how to maximize what he can do to have an instant impact right away. Pretty solid pickup there by the Pro Football Network Mock Draft Simulator in Broncos Country. Want to know your thoughts there on the Mason Smith edition in this five-round Mock Draft Simulation courtesy of Pro Football Network. Denver's final three picks here that we went with, obviously their three round five picks. They boosted the offense in a big way with playmakers at positions that they need. We'll dive deep into that here on today's brand new episode, Locked on Broncos. As we jump into the fourth quarter action on today's episode, Locked on Broncos, we're going to dive deep into three offensive selections that Denver went with in round five of this five-round mock draft simulation courtesy of Pro Football Network. Real quick, wanted to say thank you so much to everybody in Broncos country. Thank you for tuning in, making us your first listen of the day. Every single day, you can get this podcast for free on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast. We appreciate you so much. Sarah, let's continue to dive deep into this. Three round five selections here for the Denver Broncos, and they're all in close proximity to one another, which I think if Denver stays put at this juncture, they could get a run on some really good players here at this portion. And I felt like the mock draft simulator did a really good job in this instance, round five pick 136 overall, the Broncos, they added a tight end to the room. And I think what a position room we can all say here, everyone watching or listening is going to say, yeah, Denver needs another tight end. They get a guy who's a really ridiculous athlete. Who's got size, speed and athleticism that could help the Broncos in that tight end room specifically. Yes, specifically, we're talking about Theo Johnson from Penn State. He's a guy that I really like, Cody. I, I like him a lot. A 9.95 on the RAS scale, six foot six, 259 pounds, gives you a guy who has clearly NFL ready size. And I think, you know, the production at Penn State, it's like, well, they don't throw the ball. They're not throwing the ball 500 times a season or anything like that. But he had seven touchdowns last year, Cody. So I, I like his skill set, I like the size. The athleticism is obvious, but when you combine those two things, you feel like you've got a guy here that can rotate in right away. The Broncos need pass catching threats at the position. George Payton, the general manager, even noted that at the combine that they need a guy that can go over the middle of the field and make plays as a receiver. I think Theo Johnson could do exactly that. 
So you're giving Bo Nix not only just a receiver and Xavier Leggett, but you're getting him a tight end with size and athleticism there to maybe go alongside, hypothetically, if Greg Dulcich stays healthy this season, and also Lucas Kroll, and obviously a, a reliable outlet option like an Adam Trotman, which in my opinion, that right there would probably push Nate Outkins off of the roster, maybe onto the practice squad here for Denver. I like that, and you know I think you have to take a look at that. When you mentioned the seven touchdowns, that's fourth overall in the Big Ten this past season which, I mean, that's an impressive feat in and of itself. But, you know, for a guy like Theo Johnson, can you ask him to block down, right? I mean, I think we are no longer seeing in the NFL today. I don't think we're seeing a lot of teams and offensive coordinators. Okay, you're playing a great edge rusher here. Well, you're just going to go one-on-one against Max Crosby as the tight end. That's Teams aren't doing that. It's chip help. And so I think that has kind of helped the game evolve a little bit. So you're not asking, like, you're not asking him to do all this stuff unnecessarily. It's like, okay, well, if you wanted that, just draft an offensive tackle and just put an extra offensive tackle out there and don't even use a tight end inside your offense. I like this pick here. And then Denver goes on the offensive line here at round five, pick number 145th overall, a local Colorado kid, a guy who's got ties there, Drake Nugent, offensive center for Michigan. He's a product of Highlands Ranch High School here in Colorado. Spent some time playing at Stanford and then transferred and obviously just won a national championship there. I know he does a lot of work down at 6-0 strength with Matt McChesney here locally. Uh, he did work with Duke Manyweather, obviously in terms of offensive line development ahead of the NFL scouting combine. And is a guy that I feel like, in your opinion, like if you have to build the offensive line, like you already have Alex Forsythe. He was a seventh-round pick last year, but you're not going to get as long with him. You need to have center options here. And as we're starting to see, a lot of centers in the NFL draft, they don't go till the later rounds overall so you could find a gem there maybe he could be one of those options here for the denver broncos never a bad idea to load up on interior offensive linemen especially with the way we've seen them getting paid recently cody including mm. lloyd cushenberry who got what 50 million plus from the tennessee titans so not a bad idea to load up on some guys on the interior offensive line but also interesting because zach streif the broncos offensive line coach was at the Michigan Pro Day. So he was getting, he literally getting hands on all those guys. I saw there was a clip ro- running around where he's testing kind of some core strength and balance drill that he was doing out there. So literally getting hands on those players and, and seeing them up close and personal. Streep's been kind of doing a little bit of a circuit this uh, this draft cycle, by the way, Broncos fans. So maybe pay attention to where he's going and what prospects are coming along with that. But Michigan offensive linemen, they've got, I think, four or five draftable guys this year, Cody, which is, mm-hmm. is awesome for them. But Drake Nugent is one of them. How about this round This round five pick? 147th overall, so just two selections later, Marshawn Lloyd, the running back out of USC. The Broncos, I think they're in a very fascinating spot at the running back position, right? With Javante Williams and Samaj P. Ryan both being in contract years this year. We liked what we saw from Jaleel McLaughlin last year. Who's going to be that featured runner with Javante running the way that he did last year? It's tough to kind of say, well, yeah, give him 250 touches again. I mean, that's not necessarily the vibe that I'm getting or or wanting to give Cody, but I like the idea of a running back here. Give yourself some options. Give yourself a guy that can come in and maybe contribute and steal somebody's job right away. Well, and I think you have to factor in as well. You mentioned the contract years. You mentioned Javante coming off the injury there. And look, I think he's going to be fully healthy. He's going to be much better this year than he was last year. And I think also he struggled with the byproduct, how the Broncos offense was, because teams were really kind of just forcing Denver to run the football. They were taking away the passing game consistently last year. But I think with the Marshawn Lloyd pick out of USC, a couple of games that I caught specifically, you know, when I was watching the Ducks versus USC, like Marshawn Lloyd's a big guy. He's hard to bring down. And I've seen him various times this past season at USC carry guys there. Now, for a scouting profile, maybe the size, right? You talk about height, 5'8", 220 pounds. I don't think in the Broncos' overall evaluation, they're really concerned about height of this position when you look at where Jaleel McLaughlin is, right? Jaleel, he's shorter, but he's also fast as hell. You look at Marshawn Lloyd, he's short, but he's bulky. He's hard to bring down. And for me, I'm just factoring and I'm just envisioning here with this pick that the simulator did. I'm picturing a Javante Williams and a Marshawn Lloyd being those two guys that are going to run hard, that are going to be hard to bring down yard after contact type guys. And then you carve up defenses with Jaleel McLaughlin. If your run game can improve the way that we envision or expect it to this upcoming season, you look at it last year. Here's his numbers at USC 11 games played last year, 116 total rushes for 820 yards. He averaged 7.1 yards per carry and nine rushing touchdowns. But 
He also demonstrated the ability to be a receiver out of the backfield. 13 catches for 232 yards. That's 17.8 yards per catch, essentially. And what I factor in, if Denver, in if we're basing it off this mock draft here in general, if Denver can get and develop a really good screen game, not only with their wide receivers, but also with their running backs, he could be a really legitimate option outside of Jaleel McLaughlin as a pass catcher out of the backfield where the Broncos could have success in their passing game. Though I will say this, I don't want Denver to allocate a lot of their targets in the passing game to three running backs where that's their you know top five. Three of them are backs and two of them are receivers. That can't be the case here this year for the Broncos. No, but I think what you just said reminds me of the fact that with this mock draft, you're kind of – allowing yourself a bigger arsenal of weaponry on that side of the ball. You have to have it if you're the Broncos on offense. It's not enough guys to be candidates for that top five overall in touches, right? I mean, like you said, three out of the top five in total touches or targets in the passing game last year were running backs. The top three on the team in touches were running backs. It was Javante, followed by Jaleel, followed by Samaje. So that's a concern, and you need to get new guys in there and of course, we're talking about a running back here, but I like this mock draft on the whole, Cody, because number one, it gets you a direction at the quarterback position, right? It gives you a guy like Bo Nix to build the offense around. You say, what does Bo Nix do well? He gets rid of the ball quickly. He's accurate. He's obviously a play. Before, before we knew him at Oregon, Cody, he was a playmaker at Auburn. I mean, maybe a little bit by what he was being forced to do there, but I feel like he was kind of a really good in backyard QB situations and he developed into a really good, you know, systematic type of quarterback to say, okay, we can have Bo Nix in a place to take what the defense is giving. That wasn't who he was at Auburn. So the fact that he grew to that point is significant. It gives you a direction at QB, gives you another big time weapon at wide receiver. Love that pick. And I think this is a great draft to do it gives you offensive playmakers at other positions, tight end and running back. And I like the sprinkle in of Mason Smith on the defensive line. I don't think at any point after those first two picks, the Broncos, they shouldn't be drafting for need. So I like that they got value. I like that they took some interesting shots. I like that. I would really, if this was the real draft, Cody, I feel like it would be an A plus for me on paper. Ooh, Broncos country. Well, that opens it up perfectly for you. If you could grade this mock draft here, five rounds simulated courtesy of Pro Football Network's mock draft. What type of grade would you give it with the selections that we chose? If you're listening or watching on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast, make sure you let us know here on the Locked On Broncos podcast. But one thing you can expect here going forward here on the show for Mondays specifically, the theme will be Mock Draft Monday. There's going to be times where we run a manual simulation. There's going to be times where Sarah and I will run a joint simulation where he'll make one pick, I'll make the next pick. We'll weigh the pros and cons of that. And there's times where we're going to use your mock drafts that you send in to us here on the show. And Broncos country, this is the best time of the year to get involved here. Locked on Broncos, the buildup for the NFL draft. It is going to be crazy. But on tomorrow's episode of the show, here's what you can expect if you're an everyday listener. Sean Payton set to meet with the media at the NFL annual owners meetings. And we're going to figure out maybe some directions, get some insight on some of the free agency moves and maybe where they could be heading in the NFL draft. You'll get that and much more on tomorrow's brand new episode, Locked on Broncos.